Hi guys, this is Mr. Adams from Midway High School, and this is a video on analyzing the uses of radioisotopes. Okay guys, so here we go. Now there's a question here, would it be beneficial, right, if you were undergoing radiation therapy for the radioisotope, the radioactive isotope, to have a long or short half-life, or also would it be beneficial to, for it to stay a long or short time in your system okay so we're gonna move on and you guys are gonna answer that question and we're gonna analyze it later on okay guys so what you're gonna do right you're gonna take this down and you know this chart right here now most of these symbols and these um these guys right here they can be found on table o right but they table o doesn't have the list of the characteristics so here goes in terms of gamma radiation, right? Gamma radiation has no charge and also has no mass and has a very, very, very high frequency and high energy electromagnetic waves, okay? Now, alpha particles, on the other hand, have a mass of four. So they're the bulkiest guy on table O in terms of mass, right? And they have two protons and a helium. So alpha particles are basically the helium atom, right? But without electrons. Remember, helium has what? Two protons. And to make it neutral, two electrons, right? So if you take away those two electrons, helium um, alpha particles have a positive charge. And positive two to be exact. Okay. Now beta particles, guys... For our purposes, okay, you could think of them as electrons coming out of the nucleus, all right? Um, they have no mass, okay, and a charge of negative one. They have moderate to high speeds, okay? And notice here, mass zero and charge negative one. So I want you guys to look at these properties for a second, and I want you to use that information, right, to figure out, what particle is what? Alpha, beta, gamma, whatever. Now, you have this lead block right here. Now, ask yourself, why is this radioactive substance in a lead block? And it's being shot through this grating right here, okay? And in terms of these two guys right here, these are electrical plates, guys, and they're charged. One's negative and the other is positive, right? Now, the particles are behaving differently. One of the particles does this, okay? One of the particles goes straight through unaffected, and the other particle does this. Now, based on the information on the previous table right here, I want you guys to figure out which particle is which. Pause the video and knock yourselves out. Okay, guys, Um, if you said that this guy right here is the beta particle or beta ray, you're absolutely correct. Reason being, right? Beta particles, okay, beta particles, zero, negative one, E, are negative, okay. And we know in chemistry, what do opposites do? Opposites attract, there you go. So beta particles are this guy right here. They're, they're more um, attracted towards this positive plate, okay. Gamma rays have zero charge, and they're very high energy, right? So they go right through right here. And they're not affected by either the negative or the positive plate. And alpha particles are left. And we agreed, right? Alpha particles are helium atoms without the electrons. So alpha particles are positive, And they'll be attracted towards this negative plate right here. So there you go. So that's a typical type of um, regions type question where they ask you which... Um, particle will behave a certain way in an electrical field. Now take this picture down also, guys. This is showing the penetrating power of um, these guys. Alpha particles are the bulkiest, heaviest guy, and it's stopped by paper, all righty? Beta particles passes through paper, and it's stopped by human flesh. Gamma rays do this, folks. They pass through all these guys right here, and it's stopped by concrete. Remember, very high frequency, have very high energy for gamma rays. Neutrons are added here. Okay, they typically don't ask about neutrons in terms of penetrating power, but it's here, so it's stopped by water. So you could make it in that too, but primarily you're asked to be um, memorize these three guys right here, alpha, beta, and gamma. 
Okay. All righty. Let's move on. There's a reaction, um, nuclear reaction, I know you've probably heard about before, called fusion, nuclear fusion. Now, in terms of chemistry, what does fusion mean? Fusion, okay? Fusion, because of the number of meanings, right? Fusion sometimes means melting in chem one, right? But fusion, in this case, means squashing together, bringing together, right? Now, normally, you're bringing together two very light nucleuses, right? To form a heavier nuclei. Now, what are the lightest nuclei that you know, right? Um, atomic number one. Okay, hydrogen, right? Good. Now, the thing is, guys, why this reaction is so tricky is that you need an incredible amount of pressure and temperature to make it happen. Now, guys, this reaction happens on the sun. Okay, the Greek for sun is helios. Hence the name we get helium, right? Because helium is produced when the, the hydrogens are squashed together. Now, a unique thing that happens in nuclear chemistry, folks, some mass, right, is actually, quote unquote, lost, okay? And what do you think that mass is lost to? What is it turned into? It's turned into the E word. What's the E word? Energy, right? Mass to energy. And that process of the product side being a little lighter than the two reactants, that process is called mass defect. Okay, so make a note of that. Mass defect. What is mass defect? When the you, the product side is a little lighter than the reactant side because some mass was converted to energy. Okay, so once again, guys, how would you recognize a fusion reaction? You got hydrogens right here. Okay, now these guys are isotopes of each other. Remember, they got the same number of protons, but the mass number is different. Okay. There are a different number of neutrons. Okay, this mass of this guy is one, the mass of that guy is three. Okay, now when you squash these guys together, what are you going to get for your um, product? You will get four, okay, one plus three, four, over one plus one, two, four over two. And who has atomic number two? HE, right? There you go. So that's fusion. Okay, moving on. Now, in earth science, right, you've done something called fission, right? Now, fission. Okay, fissure, I'm thinking you heard this word before, and if you did art science, fissure, a crack break in the ground, right? So you're basically breaking apart a large, heavy nuclei, okay, into smaller ones. That's so how you recognize it, okay? Now, classically, folks, they will use neutrons and smash them, bombard or smash them into a large target nucleus. So this is your large nucleus right here. Now, classically, 99.9% .9 of the time, they use uranium, okay? And 99% of the time, 0.9% of the time, they use neutron to smash into the uranium to create these smaller nucleus right here and more neutrons, okay? So what happens eventually, you get a chain reaction where these neutrons are able to smash into these guys and create smaller things and so on, okay? Now, what they can do also, folks, sometimes they give you a picture and ask you, what do you think this is? Do you think this is fission or do you think this is fusion? Now, they'll give you the neutron. They'll give you the large guy right here. So you have, you have to say to yourself, oh, okay, okay, I see that this neutron is smashing into this guy, creating smaller things, creating more neutrons. There's a chain reaction happening over and over again. This guy right here is going to be fission, okay? Breaking apart. Okay. Now, on this um, this chart right here, I know it seems like a lot, but just take it down for your um, notes. Now, what you need to know mainly from this chart is mainly two things. That in fission, okay, waste is a problem. In terms of you getting the um, byproducts, okay, they're very reactive. You have to store them very carefully. That becomes problematic. Fusion has no nuclear waste. But the tricky thing about fusion, as we agreed before, you need an incredible amount of energy to um, accomplish it, right? So it's very, 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 very hard, very, very, very costly uh, for us if we were to try and duplicate it on Earth right here. Okay, it's very clean. Now, also in fission and fusion, some mass is lost to energy, the mass defect in both of them. Okay. Alrighty, you can be given a picture, as I said before. If you tell me, Tommy, see a neutron being smashed into uranium, 
think fission. Anytime you see light nuclei being squashed together, okay, to give you a slightly heavier one, okay, think fusion. Now, the red represents a proton, the red represents a proton, right? So this guy and this guy, they're isotopes, same protons, but they have a different number of what? A different number of neutrons, okay? So that's how you recognize visually fission and fusion. Okay, so let's move into the, the properties of and uses of some of these guys, okay? Radioactive isotopes. Now, if you want to date rocks, right, okay, you would use uranium-238, now, what happens here to uranium-238? It's unstable. It undergoes decay. It transmutates and changes into something else eventually, right? So it changes into lead. Okay. Now, guys, remember, um, there's a ref on your reference tables, there's a table there that shows you the half-life of things, right? So you can look at the ratio of the reds to the blues or the uraniums to the leads, and you can figure out how many half-lives passed and that can give you the age of the rock. Okay, so it's pretty, pretty cool. All right, now phosphorus P, phosphorus 32, is used as a tracer in plants. You inject it into the plant in the stem. Okay, you could follow how the nutrients travel in the leaves and so on, and you know, uh, and uh, how the reactions take place within it. So you can use this guy right here. This is a radioactive detector. Okay, you can follow the activity, okay, which part of the plant is more concentrated, which plant, more part of the plant is uh, it's, the nutrients are less used and so on. Okay, alrighty, carbon-14. Carbon-14 should be sort of kind of familiar to you if you did art science again. It's used to date or give the age of formerly living material, okay? It's also used as a tracer, okay, in organic reactions. You, um use carbon-14 instead of regular carbon, and you can tell what happens in terms of the organic reaction, where did the carbon go, and so on. But you'll tackle that more in college. But at um, high school level, we're more interested in the fact that it's used in dating um, previous living things. So, in a, for example, if you have certain fossils, for example, it can pretty much give you a reasonable um, age of those fossils based, once again, on the half-life. Okay? All righty. Okay, now, in your pantries, right, folks, I'm sure you at some time have seen iodized salt, right? Okay, the reason the salt is iodized, right, it's help, it's uses, it's used to help this, this disorder called goiter, G-O-I-T-E-R. Now, goiter causes, if you have, if, if you're fortunate enough to get it, it causes your swelling, a large kind of swelling, in your neck, okay, good swells of different sizes. So iodine 31 is used to um, detect and treat that. Okay, so thyroid disorders, iodine 31, no problem. So make sure you have iodized salt in your pantries. All right, guys, we're ending down. Cobalt 60. Now, sometimes some folks have aggressive forms of cancer, right? So they need direct radioactive um, treatment, and this is um, the what they use cobalt 64. It emits gamma rays, okay, which dark target, okay, the aggressive cancer cells. Now, the tricky thing we know from um, maybe, you know, videos or, or, or looking at uh, movies and so on, the treatment also tends to um, attack or mess up um, good cells also. So that's why cancer patients a lot of times, okay, tend to be, you know, weak. But if a cancer cancer is aggressive, okay, this is like one of your best bets to to to, to do in terms of taking the um radioactive treatment. Okay, it gives you a, you know a chance. Okay, all right. This guy right here is called technetium ninety nine, and this is used to detect cancerous cells. Okay, so this actually can figure out which cells are cancerous, malignant, and so on in your body. Okay. Alrighty, so once again, folks, these guys right here, uh, in terms of the, the uses, you would simply just have to memorize them, okay? Because they're not on your table or anything. All right, guys, last page. Dangers. Big problem, folks, in terms of storage. If the waste material 
from radioactivity is incredibly hard to store, especially if the material has a very long half-life. Um, the material, the container sometimes deteriorates, the material leaks out, and it poisons um, the environment around it from you for years and years and years and years and years to come. Okay, so storage is a big problem in with radioactivity. No one wants it in their neighborhood. You bury it and so on. It leaks into the ground. It gets into the um, aquifers and so on. It's, it's, it's problematic. Okay. Um, also, it's problematic in terms of living things. This this is an actual, um, um, uh, I, guess, I guess, a swine. Okay. In the area of, you heard of Chernobyl, right? And if you notice, right, look at this snout right here. There's mutations taking place. Now, you've heard of Chernobyl. Um, this devastation for years to come. I don't know when or if ever they would be able to clean it up in terms of the amount of um, radioactivity that was released into that particular environment. Uh, what happens sometimes with radiation too? It causes mutations, and not just for one generation. It can sometimes affect second or third generation. So these are some of the problems associated with um radiation but it, they also have good uses all right guys let's go back to this question right here the first page we're gonna wrap it up okay all righty so drum roll if guys you're taking radiation therapy you would want okay in terms of the um, analysis in terms of the treatment you would want the material the radioisotope to have a short half-life okay if it had a long half-life it wouldn't break down, it wouldn't do its work, and uh, you know, it'll be no good. Okay, now this one should be easy. Would you want it to spend a short or long time in your system? Once again, you would want it to spend a short time in your system so it would not um, destroy any good, your good cells and so on. All right, guys, um, as always, hard work plus sacrifice equals success. This video. Uh, wraps up our curriculum. We successfully finished it and uh, be well. We'll get through this.